Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. So if you want to live behind walls all your life and live an isolated, lonely, miserable life, go ahead. But I suggest that you tear down all your walls and let God be a wall of protection about you. And he says all of your walls will be called peace. to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll make your life better. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. <laughs> oh, I love this. For I am gentle, meek, humble, lowly in heart, and you will find rest, relief, ease, refreshment, recreation, and blessed quiet for your souls. For my yoke is wholesome, useful, good, I love this part. It is not harsh, hard, sharp, or pressing. <laughs> Now I have to tell you that for many years of my life, I was a harsh, hard, sharp, and pressing female. I guess I was sweet at some point. <laughs> but I don't think for me it lasted too long because... I was just a few years old when I started being abused. And you get a hardness on your soul when that's happening to you because that's the only way you know how to protect yourself. And Jesus comes to break hardness off of us and harshness and to, to crack that outer shell and let those good things that are still inside come pouring out. Amen? Amen? Jesus said, come on, come to me. I'm not harsh, hard, sharp, and pressing, but I'm humble, gentle, meek, and lowly. Let me show you how good I want to be to you. And then you take, you learn from me, and now you take this message to the world. Come on, you're, you're a preacher every day, everywhere you go. When somebody's been very unfair to you and you forgive them, they don't know what to do with you. I love this. Psalm 37, 25, and 26 says, The righteous are merciful, and they deal graciously all day long. <laughs> I love that. You might have to do it more than once in one day. Can you, are you up for that? <laughs> Anybody up for that? Woo. What are your expectations out of people? Do you expect people to be perfect, to always please you, to give you exactly what you want, when you want it? You're setting yourself up for disappointment, and that disappointment can turn to anger, and that anger can turn to bitterness, and that bitterness can turn to resentment, and that resentment can turn into a full-blown case of unforgiveness, when really, you were just expecting something that wasn't even possible. You know, I used to expect Dave to keep me happy all the time. Seriously. And it took God a lot of years to get it across to me that my responsibility was my joy, not Dave's. I expected Dave to always make me feel good about myself because I was insecure from the rejection I'd had in my childhood. It's not somebody else's job to make you feel good about yourself. That's all right, I know you're thinking. Let me say it again. It's not somebody else's job to keep you happy all the time. The Bible says that David encouraged himself <laughs> in the Lord. Amen? Let me tell you something. We have to learn to do what we do for God and expect our reward from God and not from people. And that, that is called, everybody look, that is called spiritual maturity. 
One of the strong things on my heart this year is to really try in different ways to get people to take responsibility for their lives. You're not too happy about that, are you? <laughs> yes, you know, I want Dave to make me happy. I don't think you got a good relationship if people never work to make each other happy, but I still can't give him the final responsibility for my joy. You know, I, I need encouragement from him, but what if I need it on a day when he's oblivious and isn't giving it? How many of you know, ladies, men don't always get it? I mean, they're... Sometimes they do, but they don't always get it. You know, I had some kind of virus for about a week, and I, every morning I told Dave about my virus. I mean, I just, I just wanted him to know I had it. And, <laughs> You know, come and say, oh, honey, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, I said, I had that last week, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, well, why didn't you tell me? Well, you couldn't help me. <laughs> and then about the fifth day I told him about my virus, he said, you know, it's probably just the weather. So then the next day, I was eating something, and I offered him a bite of it, and he said, well, I probably shouldn't eat after you. I said, you can't catch the weather. <laughs> Amen? If you expect the people in your life to always give you what you want, you expect your boss to give you a raise and he doesn't. You expect to get a promotion and you don't. Well, you can be angry and you can hate him and you can tell everybody else you work with just what you think of him. It's not going to hurt him. It's not going to get you a promotion. It's not going to get you a raise. It could get you fired. Why not just take it to God? We take too many things to people that we should be taking to the Lord. You know, the Bible says in John chapter 2 that Jesus was not devastated by the way his disciples behaved because he knew human nature. He didn't like the way they behaved, but he wasn't devastated by it. Now you say, well, are you just saying tonight that however people want to treat us, we should just let them get away with it? Absolutely not. Jesus was and is confrontational, yet he is also merciful. So let me talk to you a little bit about that. Let's look at John chapter 20, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came He's talking about when he appeared to the disciples after his death and resurrection. So, the other disciples kept telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said, unless I see his hands, the marks made by the nails, and put my finger into the nail prints, and put my hands into his side, I will never believe it. <laughs> wow. You, have you noticed there's no book of Thomas in the Bible? <laughs> Just make a note of that. <laughs> Just a sidebar. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them, and Jesus came, though they were behind closed doors, and stood among them and said, Peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach out your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless and incredulous, but stop your unbelief and believe. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Now here's the interesting thing. 
Jesus chastised him for his unbelief, but he met him where he was at. I love that. And you know, if you ever want to have an open door to help somebody get out of their problems, you have to first meet them where they're at. You can't want them to get all fixed up so then they can have a relationship with you so you can share with them. You got to get in people's messes with them and not even tell them about their mess until God releases you to do that if in fact he ever does. And it could be quite a while. <laughs> Don't you think it's interesting that Jesus had to make a special appearance just so Thomas could be convinced? Now, Jesus did go on to say, verse 29, because you've seen me, Thomas, do you now believe? Trust and have faith. And I love this. Blessed and happy and to be envied are those who have never seen and yet they believe. Yeah. Amen. Now, let's talk about Martha for a minute. <laughs> Luke 10, 38. Now, while they were on their way, it occurred that Jesus entered a certain village, and a woman named Martha received and welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister named Mary, who seated herself at the Lord's feet and was listening to his teaching. Now, I want you to don't let me just read you a story. I want you to put yourself in this story, okay? Jesus came to their house. They're probably gonna have some food. And I doubt that it was just Jesus, Mary, and Martha. There probably were other guests there too. And Mary right away just was so excited that the Lord was there, she stopped everything and just sat down at his feet and was soaking up every word that he said. And uh, Martha, however... Verse 40 says, overly occupied and too busy, was distracted with much serving, and she came up to him and said, Lord, now, now get the scene. Mary's sitting there, all eyes on Jesus, soaking in every word. We're going to assume there were other people around too, maybe, maybe not, but let's just have a big party if we're going to have one. Everybody's, Martha comes in, Lord, don't you care that I'm doing all the work and Mary's sitting there doing nothing. <laughs> now, how spiritually immature and totally out of order <laughs> was Martha. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha. And you know, I didn't hear the tone of his voice, but I don't think he said, Martha, Martha. He confronted her, he corrected her, but he also met her where she was at. Come on. I'm not saying that you let people just run all over you, but here's the thing, and this is a key. You know, many times throughout mine and Dave's marriage, especially in the early years, he would have to tell me that my attitude was bad or this or that or something else, and I never received it very good, but, you know, the good thing was, was, <laughs> no, I didn't, but I wasn't in ministry then. <laughs> that was after I got holy, <laughs> until I lied, and, you know. <laughs> I'm so glad to be free. So glad to be free. So glad to be able to tell the truth and not to have to be perfect and not to have to try to impress people. Jesus came for the sick, not the well. And he confronted me. But he never stopped loving me. But here's the thing that I want to share. You know, Dave would be honest with me, but he never rejected me. And here's what I think we do a lot. Somebody hurts us. We, we don't pray. We just get in their face and tell them off. <laughs> Go on. 
Then we throw up all of our walls. You're not hurting me again. You're not getting in my life again. I'm not inviting you. I'm not talking to you. I'm not coming anywhere near you. You got to remember, though, when you wall other people out, you wall yourself in. So if you want to live behind walls all your life and live an isolated, lonely, miserable life, go ahead. But I suggest that you tear down all your walls and let God be a wall of protection about you. And he says all of your walls will be called peace. Amen? Galatians 6.1 shows us what to do if somebody needs to be corrected. And I love it. Let's look at it. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if any person is overtaken in misconduct or sin of any sort, you who are spiritual, sure, that must be you. <laughs> you who are spiritual, who are responsive to and controlled by the Spirit, should number one, set him right. We love that part. Let me set you straight, buddy. <laughs> and restore <laughs> and reinstate. Help them, restore them. Tell them the truth, but do it in love. You're still my friend. I'm not rejecting you. I've made lots of mistakes myself. You're not out. You're still in. And do it without any sense of superiority. And with all what? Gentleness. Martha, Martha. Well, here, Thomas, if you have to. Don't you love it? What are some of the characteristics of a merciful attitude? A merciful person does not expose other people's faults without a very good reason. You won't believe what I heard about Mary Jane. <laughs> you are not going to believe what she did. 1 Peter 4, 8, love covers a multitude of sins. Proverbs 10, 12, hatred stirs up contention, but love covers all transgressions. Genesis 45, 1. Joseph's brothers had returned after treating him so cruelly, him being in prison for 13 years for something he did not do. Now he had been promoted by God, not man, to be second in charge to Pharaoh himself. He had all power. Nobody had any more power than Joseph except Pharaoh. There was a famine but God had put Joseph in a place where he was in control of the food. The brothers who were now starving <laughs> came to Joseph, not realizing it was Joseph. They recognized that it was Joseph. But before they recognized him, he was about to reveal himself to them. And he told the other people, take him into a room Take them into a room and everybody else go out. Come on, this is a good story. Here's the reason. He knew that he was going to move them to Egypt and take care of them and their families. And he did not want anybody in Egypt to have a bad attitude about them or to know what they had done to him. He covered him. Come on. He took them aside where nobody else could see or hear what they had done. What an amazing, no wonder Joseph got promoted. Okay, let me end with this. You know, mercy, you have to understand this. Mercy 
is never deserved. If you're waiting to give mercy to somebody who deserves it, <laughs> you're never going to be merciful to anybody because mercy is not mercy if it's earned. <laughs> then it's something else. <laughs> and the Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 7, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And so let's look at that from two sides. When you make a mistake, God wants to give you mercy. He doesn't want you to try to sacrifice to make up for it. And I'm not talking about Old Testament sacrifices of animals and things like that. But we sacrifice. We try to sacrifice to make up for it. You make a mistake, well, surely you can't be happy that day. I mean, you can't just go ahead and be happy on the day you lied. <laughs> Got to go into mourning and hang your head down. Wouldn't dare pray and ask God for anything, certainly not anything very much. Because after all, you're paying. Come on, does anybody know what I mean? But Jesus said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And then when we look at the other side of it, God wants us to give mercy and not make other people sacrifice to get back into our good graces. Some of you ain't sure you're liking this. You're like, yeah. And I know what you're doing. Some of you are thinking about specific situations. How people, well, they're going to walk all over me. Well, they're going to, you know, they're going to take advantage of me. I didn't say that you let people walk all over you. There's even situations where you may have to stay away from somebody. But you can still have a merciful attitude toward them and how you talk about them, what you tell other people about them, how you pray for them. It's all about attitude. It's all about the heart attitude of how we see people. You know, we, we can be merciful to people that are in prison. I don't know about you, but I did some things in my younger years that if I would have got caught, I could have been there with them. Come on. I don't know about you, but I was sexually abused for about 15 years. I could have been a prostitute. I don't need to judge prostitutes and have an attitude. But for the grace of God, there go I. I don't need to judge people that are, have addictions in their life. I was spared from that by the grace of God. I tried getting drunk a few times. I didn't like it. I want to be in control. So I gave that up a long time ago. <laughs> I don't want none of this not knowing what I'm doing. I... <laughs> but I could have gone that route. I had a lot of pain in my soul. But for the grace of God. Come on. But for the grace of God, there go I. Come on, give God a big praise tonight. Well, it is very important to be merciful, but also you want to keep in mind that you can't give mercy to others if you haven't received mercy from God for yourself. Sometimes we just need to not be so hard on ourselves and then we won't be so hard on other people. But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living.
Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and, you know, taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, as we travel around the world, we meet so many wonderful children that have had such desperate need in their life. And we're so grateful to be able to help them. Today, we happen to be in Thailand. And this little boy's name is Somded. And he's had some tragic things in his life, but thank God, through your help, he's now living in the children's home here, and his life is looking very bright. His parents both died when he was six in an auto accident. And when they found him to bring him here to the home, he had had severe ear infections, which had caused hearing loss and lots of other problems in his ears. So he's had about two years of medical treatment on his ears, and thank God he can hear fine now. And so thank you for helping us provide homes for Somded and for other little boys and girls like him all around the world. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan de mensen boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand. Wilt u meehelpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl partner.